On the 25th of October, 1415, the age of chivalry died. This was the moment when a hundred years of war came to its bloodiest climax. At Agincourt, an army of French knights, fighting under ancient chivalry codes of honor, came face to face with a new and ruthless approach to warfare. And the brutal encounter that followed set the seal on the medieval world. The world's worst century witnessed the longest conflict in history. Already ravaged by plague and social unrest, the Hundred Years' War between England and France dominated the 14th century. But the pivotal moment came at Agincourt in northwest France. The old order of feudal power was suddenly swept aside. A new, more modern world emerged of nation states and monarchs. Agincourt is the classic story of how Henry V triumphed over the French against impossible odds. A few thousand bowmen, the original band of brothers, snatched a heroic victory over some 25,000 knights. But this film has unearthed contemporary records and first-person accounts of the battle, hidden away in the archives of ancient universities and libraries, here and in France, that tell a different story. This is the dramatic eyewitness view of the last and bloodiest pitch battle of the medieval age, in which valor in combat was to prove no match for a ruthless war machine. John Stevens was a chaplain with King Henry V's army. His chronicle of life on the road with Henry's men records the English experience of Agincourt in minute detail. This extraordinary account, detailing the personal stories of the men who fought and died there, forms the basis of this film. Men like John Leveridge and William Thornton, who are professional archers from Lancashire, and Davy Gam, a Welsh mercenary and a former rebel. He'd switched sides and become Henry V's personal bodyguard with a moral duty to fight and die for his king. First-hand accounts of the battle from the French point of view have been locked away in documents buried in their national archives. From these untapped records, we can piece together the personal stories of the Frenchmen who would meet the English at Agincourt. Their commander, Marshal Boussicot. His battle plan, recently discovered in the archives, reveals how his knights should have crushed the English. And we can tell the extraordinary story of two of France's greatest noblemen. Sir Gilbert de Lannoy, one of France's most decorated knights, and the Duke of Brabant, a scion of the Burgundy family. Their stories reveal how the defeat at Agincourt was the result of a fatal devotion to an outdated code of honor. Le devoir d'un chevalier est de défendre la veuve et l'orphelin. Le devoir d'un chevalier est de poursuivre les voleurs. Le devoir d'un chevalier est de faire la guerre à ses ennemis. The armies of medieval France were composed almost exclusively of armored knights. In 1415, Sir Gilbert de Lannoy was amongst the most illustrious in the land. A veteran campaigner, he'd been on his first crusade at the age of 12. He'd been imprisoned by the English once before, captured on a pilgrimage to Ireland in 1411. Lannoy's ransom had been paid by his friend and ally, Antony, Duke of Brabant, one of the richest noblemen in France. Now the time had come for Brabant to take his place within the ranks of an elite brotherhood. For someone like the Duke of Brabant, the knighting ceremony would be one of the pinnacles of his career. It's a ritual purification. He has to have the vigil overnight in church. He has ritual baths so that his sins are washed away from him. And he is being inducted into a whole new way of life. As a newly dubbed knight, Brabant was submitting to an ancient code of honor and courage. It was known as the Order of Chivalry, and France was its heartland. Nowhere in Europe was the nobility so committed to its lofty ideals. There's no easy way of describing what chivalry actually means. 
It's all about the one person. It's not about the organised military effort. It's about personal glory and proving yourself the strongest, the best, the most loyal, the most courteous, the most devoted to women, um, the absolute acme of perfection. Es-tu prêt à te soumettre au devoir du chevalier et à choisir la mort plutôt que la lâcheté Si j'avais déjà un pied au paradis, je le retirerais pour aller guerroyer. Everything in that ceremony meant something. We tend to think of knighthood now as being tapped on the shoulder politely with a sword. That didn't happen. In medieval knighthood, it's the slap across the cheek. And that is the last blow that they should ever accept and not return. <laughs> and then he is acclaimed by everybody as a member of this chivalrous elite. He is now an official knight. The Englishman that was destined to meet these knights on the battlefield was a very different animal. In medieval Europe, the English longbowmen had a fearsome reputation. In the town of Salisbury, on their way to join up with King Henry V's army, one group of archers from Lancashire was already stirring up trouble. Some of Henry's archers were very well-armed criminals. He had emptied jails, he had offered amnesties for people that would come to France uh, and fight in his army. The Sunday after St. Peter in Chains. A crowd of the Duke of Lancaster's bowmen, engaged to set out with the king overseas, attacked many of the city's men in the Fisherton alehouse, killing four of them, viz. John Baker, William Hoare, Henry, his servant, and John Tanner. To consider what to do about the terrible affray. The chaplain's account doesn't record what triggered the violent attack by the Lancashire bowmen. But we do know the names of two of the archers involved, William Thornton and John Leverage. In August 1415, they were amongst thousands of volunteers from all walks of life, lured to Southampton by the prospect of adventure and profit in a war against France. When they weren't fighting for the king, they earned a living as farm workers, but after years of war between the English crown and Welsh rebels, they'd become part of a deadly and ruthless strike force. The English army is largely composed of archers. These are people that you are not going to mess about with. They are armed to the teeth and they are professional killers. They are men who have trained every single week at the archery butts. They know how to handle their weapons and they are hugely skilled in the use of that weapon. By 1415, the longbow was an important part of everyday life in England and Wales. For the past century, archery practice had been compulsory on Sundays. The aim was to ensure a steady supply of bowmen for royal service in the conflict we now call the Hundred Years' War. With an ambitious new king in charge, archers were going to be needed. In 1413, Henry V had inherited the throne. Henry's first move was to strengthen his popular support by reasserting an ancient English hereditary claim to the French crown. I don't think there's any question at all that Henry V genuinely believed that he had legal rights in France and that he was justified in making war. But at the same time, Henry V is launching this campaign in order to stabilize the position in England. His father had usurped the throne from Richard II, and that had created an awful lot of difficulties. And so one of the best ways of stabilizing the country at home was to launch an aggressive war overseas, uniting the nobility behind him. 
Tempted by the prospect of a profitable looting spree, more than 11,000 battle-hardened soldiers had signed up for duty in Southampton. Next. Henry V's armor was hugely experienced. Um, a lot of his men were his trusted men of arms who'd fought with him in the Welsh Wars. They'd had lots of experience of fighting together as units. To raise a fleet, every ship in the country had been commandeered. Every town had sent provisions. Every goose in the land had to sacrifice six wing feathers for arrow flights. England was witnessing the beginnings of his first professional army. Henry V knew that what mattered was paying your troops, making sure they were well paid, fed, watered and supplied. And he knew that that was absolutely critical. Everything's organised down to the last detail. He draws up muster rolls. Everything is paid for. And it's a personal relationship with the king that you quite simply don't get in France. John Leverage, master bowman, is retained by us to provide war service in the expedition we will make shortly, taking for himself sixpence per day, sealed in the third year of our reign, 1415. The English were streets ahead of the French in their military organization. Next. The French were still in the 15th century operating in a very feudal manner. In other words, the French king was calling upon the aristocrats of France to appear because of their feudal obligation. Name? William Thornton. The English were moving forward to what we know as a contract system, where the king would buy support for an extended period of time under specific terms of service. William Thornton, yeoman, armed and arrayed, appropriately to his rank, is retained by us to provide war service in the expedition we will make shortly, taking for himself six pence per day, sealed in the third year of our reign, 1415. In August 1415, French knights Gilbert de Lanois and the Duke of Brabant began to prepare for the ultimate test of their chivalric credentials, all-out war. The knight of medieval Europe was the warrior elite. He was the, the elite class in a military society. These people existed to fight. That was their reason for being. That was the core of their existence. Protected by the latest steel plate armor, and equipped with state-of-the-art weaponry, a French knight was a fearsome killing machine. With the right leadership, Lanois and Brabant would be invincible. But France had a problem. King Charles VI was mad. The French King Charles VI is suffering periodic bouts of insanity. During these bouts of madness, he suffers from the delusion that he's made of glass. He's a transparent pane of glass, which is not good news in terms of leading an army into battle. Charles had even ordered that steel rods be inserted into the seams of his clothing to prevent his body from shattering. With the king incapable of ruling, France's noble houses were engaged in a bitter power struggle. Medieval France, with a population of 15 million, was five times bigger than Henry's England. But his subjects were divided into rival fiefdoms, each with their own private armies. Supremacy was disputed between the Lords of Armagnac and John, the Duke of Burgundy. France is wrapped up in a vicious and violent civil conflict. The great princes of the blood are vying with each other for political power, 
France was divided between two camps, the Armagnacs and the Burgundians. And it was that hostility which was much more important than any great sense of Frenchness. With a weak king and a fractured state, it seemed that France was ripe for the plucking. On the 14th of August, 1415, Henry V seized his opportunity and the final chapter of the Hundred Years' War began. His army landed in Normandy. On his way to the Great Battle of Agincourt, Henry attacked the rich port of Harfleur. But for five long weeks, the French garrison held out. By mid-September, English supplies were running low. Hundreds of Henry's men were dead. Then, unexpectedly, the gates of the town were thrown open in surrender. One of the first men into the town? The Welsh mercenary Davy Gam. His first prisoner, the captain of the French garrison. Gam was one of King Henry's most feared men at arms. He'd been fighting in battle since the age of 16. And he was renowned for his ability to kill with a single blow. Gam's favorite weapon, the spiked war hammer. Perfect for crushing enemy skulls. I spent three weeks of my life waiting to be served that! But for Davy Gam, there would be no killing this day. People understood that there were certain rules that you played by, that you didn't always, well, you didn't normally kill your prisoners. If you were a knight going out to fight in a battle, you expected, on the whole, to come back again. And if you weren't uh, fortunate enough to be on the winning side, and if you were captured, then you expected to be ransomed. That was the way things were done. The table. So, what have we got here then? Sono il Duca di Arcourt. Fine. You can have one. Il rifiuto di parlare. Well, he speaks Italian or French, we know not. Let me finish this work now. Maybe. No. Let me finish this no. work now. No. no. On the Bible. I swear. As the captains of Harfleur had agreed to surrender. In accordance with the code of chivalry, they were released. On one condition, that they turn themselves in at the end of the campaigning season and submit to King Henry as prisoners for ransom. It is quite extraordinary how committed these knights were to the code of chivalry. They all turn up to a man after the Battle of Agincourt. And to, I think to modern minds that is completely incomprehensible. You know, why didn't they just scarf her while they had the chance? The killing of prisoners was off limits. But for the English longbowmen, Thornton and Leverage, basic survival was top of the agenda. By the time Harfleur fell, they hadn't eaten a decent meal in two weeks. Looting and the spoils of war were part and parcel of the package. The soldiers who were fighting in Henry V's army, just like any other medieval war, were there not only for the honor and glory that could be won, but also to grab whatever they could carry. There were specific rules permitting this to take place. After almost a 100 years of war with France, it was said that no English home was complete without at least one stolen French souvenir. William Thornton's Hall at Harfleur, a woolen blanket, a full belly, and a silver crucifix. Amid much lamentation, tears, and grief, 2,000 townsfolk were escorted beyond the limits of the army, lest they should be molested by the thieves amongst us who are more given to pillage than to pity. 
And thus, by the judgment of God, they became travelers where they had thought themselves inhabitants. And it was granted to each at departing five sous. Across France, the attack on Harfleur had triggered a wave of indignation. By order of the king's government, France's sacred war banner was unfurled, signaling a chivalry crusade against the English. In the city of Rouen, France's nobles gathered with their armies in readiness for war. Amongst them, French knights Sir Gilbert de Lanois and Anthony, Duke of Brabant. In September, the sacred banner of France, the Oriflamme, is unfurled. It's taken out of the Abbey of the Kings at Saint-Denis. The presence of a foreign king and an invading army seems to have really rallied France in a way that I don't think Henry expected, and I don't think the French did either. Thousands and thousands, more and more, are turning up. The commanders have no idea how many are going to actually arrive, but it far exceeds expectations. But it wasn't only the French nobles who were stirred up by the call to arms. In Paris, more than 6,000 common townsfolk signed up to fight the English. Le roi ne devrait pas accepter l'aide de ses mains. Nous sommes déjà trois fois plus nombreux que les Anglais. La plèbe ne mérite pas de porter les armes. The French nobility do not want to run the risk of arming the peasantry. It's just seen as too dangerous. Second and much bigger reason is the whole chivalric outlook. Because France is the home of chivalry, it should be the aristocracy that form the army and win the battles. And they don't want the ordinary rabble, the hoi polloi, getting any of that glory. The army that would save France was to be a noble one. And for the French knight, the Duke of Brabant, a full-scale pitched battle would be his first chance to test his chivalric mettle. Agincourt was a great opportunity for any knight like the Duke of Brabant, who hadn't actually taken part in a battle, to prove his worth, to prove that he had actually not only been theoretically awarded knighthood, but deserved it. So there was great pressure on him to perform, as it were. But the civil war in France imposed other obligations on the Duke of Brabant. His older brother, the Duke of Burgundy, controlled a third of all France, and he was plotting to usurp King Charles and place himself on the throne. My Lord of Brabant, it is now some time since our king has marched against the English and ordered us to hold ourselves in readiness for war. We need hardly state that we require you not to attend the summons of the king or any other lord, whatever might be his rank, under pain of our displeasure. Burgundy had sworn never to fight on the same side as King Charles. Now he ordered his brother to stay at home. Brabant's choice, defy his family, or miss out on the most glorious moment of his career. In October 1415, the English army marched north from Harfleur. They were heading for the safe haven of Calais, an English-held port. King Henry V had received reports that a huge French army was gathering to fight him, but he wasn't prepared to abandon his mission without a final show of strength. Henry V's strategy in 1415 was to drive through the French countryside torching and destroying and pillaging in order to demoralize the French population and to undermine the position of the French king. But it was the English themselves who were now in grave danger. The siege of Harfleur had cost valuable time. Their campaign was four weeks behind schedule. Hunger was setting in. William Thornton and his fellow archers had been reduced to scavenging for shellfish from polluted harbors. The result? 
a ravaging dysentery epidemic. And while Thornton grew weaker, the French grew stronger. Eager to stake their place in a glorious battle against the English, knights were now flocking to Normandy from every corner of France. The mood as the French army builds before Agincourt is we can, we can leave the civil war, we can leave the feuding behind, it's a moment of destiny that it might go somewhere absolutely amazing. And people suddenly start thinking, I don't want to be left out of that. I don't want to be the person who was at home when that happened. Whilst Brabant wrestled with his conscience, the combined forces of the French nobility were now closing in on Henry's men. For the English troops moving through the Norman countryside, it must have been a terrifying experience. All the way they were being followed and harassed by the vanguard of the French army, and we shouldn't underestimate just how bedraggled and tired the English army was as it moved through the Norman countryside, trying to seek Calais as a last refuge. The 29th of September. Died of the bloody flux. Robert Piper, Thomas de Keeley, Roger Pemberton and... William Thornton. William Thornton, the English archer, was buried in a makeshift grave at the side of the road. French scouts looked on as more than 2,000 Englishmen, one quarter of Henry's army, died of dysentery. But the soldier in charge of the French army was in no hurry to do battle. In the absence of the mad King Charles, command had fallen to his most loyal general, Marshal Jean Boussicot. Boussicot was a rarity in medieval France, a man of common stock who'd risen to become a knight of grand renown. Someone like Boussicot, who may not have been the highest born, uh, was able to become one of the most important uh, military leaders of his time because of his prowess. He was one of the greatest jousters of his day. He was famous for his uh, extreme devotion to training and fighting and tournaments. Boussicot knew the English were getting weaker by the day, but experience told him to bide his time. Small English armies had inflicted heavy defeats on French forces before in the Hundred Years' War. At Cressy, and Poitiers. In those battles, French cavalry charges had been decimated by units of English archers fighting in groups alongside armored knights and men-at-arms. Boussicot was determined not to make the same mistake. The question was, in the heat of battle, would France's nobility take orders from a man they considered to be their inferior? Boussicot drives the English further and further inland, away from their supplies, knowing that their army is weakened. There's a mood of desperation in the English army. It's an absolute crisis point. The 14th of October. When we made camp to share out the provisions, such was the shortage of meat and bread that many had to eat nuts and leaves. With these delicacies, the athletes of England were fed. Then, a sudden breakthrough. On the 15th of October, the English found a shortcut across the River Somme. It seemed they had eluded Marshal Boussicot's army, and the safety of Calais was now just a short march away. Just as we reached the top of the hill, on the other side, we saw emerging about half a mile away from us the grim-looking ranks of the French, filling the broad field like a countless swarm of locusts. And the forest of spears, with the great helmets gleaming in between, was truly terrifying. And there was only a valley and not so wide at that, 
between us and them. Busico had brilliantly maneuvered his forces. He predicted the exact point where the English would cross the River Somme. And he'd sent his main army ahead in a pincer movement, cutting off their escape route to Calais. The English were trapped. When at last the light failed and darkness had fallen between us and them, every man who had not previously cleansed his conscience by confession put on the armor of penitence. And the only shortage that night was one of priests. John Leverage, Davy Gam, and the rest of the English army now knew a pitched battle was unavoidable. Tomorrow, they would come face to face with a vast horde of armored knights. Just half a mile away, a very different mood. Through the night, the French nobles mocked King Henry and drank to the coming victory. The French were hugely, hugely confident. Because they outnumbered the English, at least by three to one and possibly five or six to one. I think the French just couldn't believe that, that a small force, having only a small percentage of noble warriors, could possibly compete with their numbers. But Marshal Boussico wasn't taking the English lightly and he devised a strategy to outwit them. In his battle plan, Boussico had ruled out the traditional head-on cavalry charge. They'd failed before against the English. The bulk of his army would advance carefully on foot, supported by a secret weapon, crossbowmen from Italy. At the same time, his cavalry would outflank the English and crush them with a surprise attack from the sides and rear. Without the protection of his bowmen, King Henry and his knights would be helpless. At dawn on the 25th of October, the combined armies of the French nobility prepared to bury their differences and crush their weakened English enemy. Boussico had laid out his knights in three great battalions, numbering over 25,000 men. Facing them at the far end of the muddy field, Davy Gam, John Leverage, and 6,000 weary Englishmen. For three hours, the army stood and watched each other. To launch an attack over the boggy ground would be dangerous. Then at 11 a.m., Henry ordered his men to advance. A bow shot's distance from the French lines, John Leverage and his archers hammered their stakes into the mud, strung their bows, and waited. The English archers, in order to enrage the French and to cause them to drive at the English line, waved two fingers in the air in that famous modern salute. The story is that the French had threatened, if they captured the archers, to cut off those fingers to prevent them ever firing a bow and arrow again. And Marshal Boussico now had cause for concern. Through the banners that were cluttering the front line, he could now see the English archers had taken up position at the narrowest point on the battlefield. Protected on each flank by dense woodland, there was no room for Boussico's horsemen to make their flanking attack. But for the French nobles, the crude taunts of the English had become too much to bear. Without waiting for orders, the leader of the cavalry, William de Saveurs, launched a head-on charge against the English line. 
I think that these French aristocrats must have been thinking about the lessons of their predecessors. Their fathers and their grandfathers have been humiliated time after time on the battlefield against the English. Of course, the lesson of their predecessors was that a full-scale charge would be unsuccessful. But they didn't understand why that tactic failed. Their way of thinking was that the charges given by their fathers and their grandfathers had failed because those men were not chivalrous enough. By ignoring their commander, Marshal Boussicot, the French nobility had played straight into the English hands. A head-on cavalry charge into the lines of battle-hardened English troops was doomed. For Boussicot, the point must have come when he realised that it was all going horribly wrong. I think they clearly underestimated the effect that the English archers were going to have. Within minutes, hundreds of horses and their riders were cut to ribbons by a storm of arrows. Six days before the Battle of Agincourt, the Duke of Brabant, the French aristocrat who had yet to be tested in battle, defied his brother, the Duke of Burgundy, to fulfill his chivalric duty. The whole chivalric code had this idea that there were grades of, of fighting that you had to go through. The most honourable of all is to take part in a battle, and that gives you brownie points on a massive scale because it is the, the highest form of fighting. And so, to be offered the opportunity of fighting in a great battle, particularly a battle against the ancient enemy of France, against England, um, was something that somebody like the Duke of Brabant really couldn't turn down. On the morning of the 25th of October, news arrived that the battle had already begun, but Brabant was still a two-hour ride from Agincourt. Eighteen miles away, the French commander, Marshal Boussicot's carefully laid plans were being shot down by a ruthless English war machine. Gilbert de Lanois and his fellow knights looked on in horror as the French cavalry was cut to pieces. Now, with their honor on the line, there could be no going back. Your every move is, is being weighed in the scales of, of chivalry. If you flee the battle, Somebody is going to be there, probably the herald on the sidelines is going to be there, marking down that the chap with the red cross and the silver whatevers had fled the battlefield and they will look him up and, and write it down and it will go in your annals of your family history. <laughs> Davy Gam, John Leverage, and the rest of Henry's men were outnumbered by more than three to one. Thousands of dismounted French knights now charged at their line. In the first rank, Gilbert de Lannoy. The French thundered into the center of the English line. The English are desperate. I mean, they're in a, a terrible position. It is do or die for them. For a moment, the line began to give way. But the English discipline of Leverage, Gam, and Henry's men paid off. The English held firm. And now it was the French knights, like Lanois, who had a problem. It had been raining hard for two weeks. If Lanois fell in the boggy ground, it would be impossible to get up in his heavy armor. The sky darkened with all these arrows coming down. The French men at arms know that they have to look downwards because if they look up, they're going to get the arrows through the visors of their helms. It's their weakest point. Panic was beginning to spread through the French ranks. And now a new, unforeseen danger was gathering. There were simply too many French knights for
for that particular battlefield. Although they were hugely skilled and incredibly well equipped, none of that matters if you can't move and you can't breathe and if you, you can barely stand up. The horses have been maddened by all these arrows and the horses are actually leaping over them and crushing them and yet they've got all this pressure of the weight of the men behind them as well. As the French bodies piled up in front of the English lines, the English archers abandoned their bows and swept into the fray with dagger and malice. For Lanois and his noble knights, the unthinkable was happening. Trapped in the mud and crushed by the men coming on behind, the French knights had become sitting ducks. Up close and personal, this would have been a very, very dirty, unpleasant business. Uh, we know from certain grave finds that both legs of a person could be hacked off in a single blow, that, that arms, could, arms, hands, heads could be removed in a single blow. Less than one hour after the French cavalry charge, 1,200 humiliated knights found themselves prisoners of the English. Amongst them, Sir Gilbert de Lanois and the French commander-in-chief, Marshal Jean Boussicot. We persuaded ourselves that the sight of so many princes would strike terror into the enemy, and that to win the day, we had to do nothing but charge quickly and boldly. Oh, eternal dishonor. If it is a consolation for men of honor to think they have been beaten by adversaries of noble origin, it is a double shame to be defeated by unworthy and vile Englishmen. What had promised to be a glorious victory for the French was turning into a massacre. It's thought that at least 8,000 French knights were slaughtered in the first 90 minutes of battle. Men trod on their own entrails. Others vomited forth their teeth. Some still standing had their arms cut off. The dying rolled in the blood of strangers. Two hours after the first disastrous cavalry charge, the untested French knight, the Duke of Brabant, arrived at the battlefield. When the Duke reached Tazincourt, he gazed upon a most piteous scene. Because neither his suit of armor nor his banner had yet arrived, he took on the armor of a dead man. For his coat of arms, he took a flag from a pole axe and placed it over his head. The Duke of Brabant can't bear to be left out of it. So he comes charging up and he's in such haste to get to the battle that he can't even wait for his own men. He doesn't even have time to arm himself properly and put on his full coat armor, which would identify him in the battlefield. In his makeshift armor, the young Brabant saw his opportunity to win his chivalric spurs. He rallied his men for a counterattack. His knights threw themselves at Henry's bodyguards, amongst them, Davy Gam, the Welsh man at arms. The French are within feet of actually killing Henry V himself, and that's how close the French got. One of the jewels on his own circlet crown, the helmet that the king is wearing, is hacked off. And if the king had been cut down, it would have been game over. It would have been the end of the battle. But Davy Gam carved a path through the enemy, leading King Henry out of danger. And for his loyalty, he was to pay a heavy price. As a member of the king's personal guard, Gam was taken to a medical tent at the rear of the battle. An anesthetic made up of opium, hemlock juice, and boar's gallbladder was administered. Rabbit fur and egg white were used to staunch the flow of blood. 
But for serious injuries like the axe wound in Gam's arm, amputation was the only treatment on offer. A hot iron was prepared to cauterize the wound. But by now, there was little point. While Davy Gam lay dying, the Duke of Brabant's attack had come close to turning the tide of battle. But it was not to be, and Brabant's glorious charge would bring only greater disaster. By mid-afternoon, a famous English victory was almost secure. But King Henry now had a problem. He'd taken thousands of prisoners, far more than his men could handle. Fearing they would rise up and join Brabant's last-ditch attack, Henry now called up his toughest unit of archers, amongst them John Leverage. His orders? To kill the French prisoners in cold blood. During a counterattack by the Duke of Brabant, the cries went up, kill your prisoners. I was put in a barn with the dead and injured. To get it done quickly, they set fire to the barn where we lay. Thanks to the grace of God, I escaped on my hands and knees, but was taken again and sold to the Duke of Cornwall. More than 2,000 prisoners were burned alive or butchered by Leverage and his fellow longbowmen. It was a shocking violation of the chivalric code. This one thing is seen as being the big blot on Henry V's character is that he ordered the massacre of all the French prisoners uh, during the Battle of Agincourt. It just goes against all our notions of what chivalry is meant to be. We have to understand that when Henry V had taken those prisoners, it was an entirely sensible military decision to kill them. The rear of the English line was under attack. There was a danger that those prisoners might break free from their captors and attack the English force from the rear. King Henry had ordered that only the top nobles were to be spared. In his makeshift armor, the aristocrat Brabant was mistaken for a servant and killed. The age of chivalry was over. The battle that had set the seal on the medieval age decimated the French nobility, which lost its hold on power. But in a final twist, this defeat would sow the seeds of victory. A new and modern army rose from the ashes of Agincourt, led not by noble knights, but unified under a lowly peasant girl, Joan of Arc. Fighting for an emerging nation, France, the French would finally defeat the English and end the Hundred Years' War, the conflict that had dominated the 14th century. When the strength of the enemy had been utterly wasted, and the rigors of battle ended. We, who had gained the victory, came back through the heaps of the slain. And I truly believe there is not a man with a heart of flesh or even stone who, had he seen and pondered the bitter wounds of so many Christian men, would not have dissolved into tears time and again for grief. Chaplain John Stevens returned to England and retired from the cloth. Four years later, he went blind. He lived out the rest of his life as a recluse. Longbowman John Leverage was released from service in November 1415 and disappeared from the historical record. The Welsh man-at-arms, Davy Gam, was knighted posthumously on the battlefield by Henry V.
and the French knight, Sir Gilbert de Lanois, spent two years in an English prison. He later agreed to become a spy for the English king, surveying Arab fortifications in the Holy Land. In 